the cost of health care in the United States is simply becoming unaffordable. Today, what we see is that everyone but the 1% is at risk of financial disaster from even a relatively minor health care encounter. Politicians, they're always saying bad pharma, bad insurers, bad device makers. But no one goes after the hospitals. And yet, they are the biggest source of price increases in the last decade. They found tumors in his liver and in his colon. I started to have trouble with pain in my face and my left ear. I was diagnosed with a very rare cancer. I've had breast cancer twice, have lung cancer twice. Well, they found another spot on my lung. I don't want to say on my deathbed, crap, I'm dying because they wouldn't let me see the doctor. Hospitals, they made a trillion dollars last year. And it's going up. And the reason is not because we're getting so much better hospital care. <laughs> it's because the hospitals have merged and consolidated and they're demanding higher prices. The vast majority of the hospitals are still considered not for profit. Even though they do all the profit making things we see them doing today, our bodies are the ATMs. So, what's your salary? Six million dollars. It's a non profit hospital paying exorbitant executive pay. They're supposed to be a charity. They weren't so charitable in staying in a community that actually needed their services. A lot of times people get mad and say, well, somebody needs to do this. Well, who's the somebody? I should not be in medical debt to my employer. Because of your greed, people are going to die. Can you look me in the eye and tell me that you don't care? You have no conscience. You have all lost your souls. If you think this battle is not real, you need to look at me. It crosses all color lines. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, we are all one. We should not have to choose between bankruptcy or death. Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome to our Facebook Live panel discussion about Inhospitable, the documentary you've just watched. I am Julie Robner, Chief Washington Correspondent at Kaiser Health News, and I'm pleased to be joined tonight by Sandra Alvarez, writer, director, and co-producer of the film, along with two featured characters. One is my boss, KHN Editor-in-Chief Elizabeth <laughs> Rosenthal. The other is Beth McCracken, a patient advocate who was also one of the patients caught in the crossfire between UPMC and Heim Mark. I'm going to start the discussion, but I hope you, the audience, will chime in with questions too. You can ask them right there on the Facebook page or in the YouTube chat, and they will uh, ferry them to me. Um, so let me start with you, Sandra. Hospitals aren't the usual villains in stories about our dysfunctional healthcare system. We're used to hearing more about insurance companies or pharmaceutical companies. How did you land on hospitals to make this film about? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, you know, for me, uh, well, of course, it's no surprise that we do have a very dysfunctional healthcare system. Uh, but yeah, you just don't hear very much about hospitals. Of course, you hear about high a bill, somebody complaining how, you know, an incredibly high bill at a hospital. Of course, we've all heard those stories. But, you know, I wasn't really hearing a lot about the healthcare system and how hospitals were, um, you know, affecting the system in a holistic way. So, um, you know, and you watch presidential debates and, you know, I was watching 2018, 2019, and you hear them railing against insurance and big pharma and medical device makers, but you do not hear hospitals. So um, I read Elizabeth Rosenthal's book, An American Sickness, uh, which is absolute required reading for anyone who wants to learn about our healthcare system. And I learned more about the big business of hospitals and realized there just had not been a documentary about this and that there was a film here. So 
Libby, I think most people think about hospitals the way they think about Congress. They don't like them as a group, but they like their individual hospital a lot. When did the friendly neighborhood nonprofit hospital become so fixated on making money? Kind of a slow progression. I, I you know, at the beginning, like when I was a doctor in the 80s and 90s, hospitals were terrible at this kind of thing. I mean, many states had DRG pricing where if you went in for pneumonia, the hospital just got a fixed price. Um, that kind of went by the wayside. And in the 90s, where where I like to attribute it to is there was this HMO era where hospitals that were very inefficient were really getting squeezed by HMO pricing. And so they did what American you know, the the American way, they hired a bunch of consultants like McKinsey and um, who came in and said, you know, gosh, you guys, you're leaving all this money on the table. You could just do everything you're doing, but bill a whole lot better for it. And they even came in with like little temptations like, you know, uh, as a little tease, we'll show you how to do better on your U.S. news ratings without really changing what you do. So um, at that point, the business of healthcare really started inserting itself into hospitals. And there was kind of this flip where, you know, for a while, healthcare was still on the front burner and business on the back burner, because in truth, you know, in the 80s, hospitals were terrible at business. They were horribly run, they were inefficient. But what happened over time is the metric of success became, uh, how is your revenue? What is your return on investment? Um, hospital CEOs that are the focus and you know one of the, fo the, the, the foci of the story get these big salaries, not based on whether they deliver good care, but whether they deliver good profits. And as you'd note, um, Sandra, in the, in, in the film, you know, these are not for profit hospitals. So they, by definition, can't show profit. But what they show is huge operating surpluses, which because by definition, they're not for profit, they just plow into building, hiring, um, high salaries. And, and you know, we, we've seen this even escalate during the pandemic in terms of, you know, uh, hospitals in the U.S., Building uh, the Cleveland Clinic is building a hospital, a fancy private hospital across from Buckingham Palace. I mean, is that how I want the the ta the 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 healthcare dollars of Ohio taxpayers spent? I don't think so. So now what we see is a system where, you know, the business is on the front burner, and what's good for patients really, it's kind of. I won't say it's quite irrelevant because there are a lot of good doctors and nurses and people in the system, but they're not incentivized to de to deliver good care by the values of our current healthcare system. So, Beth, you were obviously one of those patients who was caught in the middle of this fight with Highmark Insurance and UPMC doctors and and threatened with the the loss of those doctors. Um, if, if a, an agreement was not uh, found, we saw at the end that you actually won that fight. Um, tell us how you're doing and what's happened in the Pittsburgh health uh, system since the Sandra finished making the film. Well, um, I'm actually doing pretty well. I um, When this all started and I got my diagnosis, the, the cancer is so rare that they no one knew what to do with it except for to cut it out and radiate it and hope for the best. Um, unfortunately, it metastasized to my lungs, um, and we didn't know what to do about that. But in the three years, well, two years since my diagnosis, they actually came up with something that is working. It's a I take a daily oral chemotherapy, and um, I take it three weeks on and one week off. I'm actually at the end of my three weeks. So if I seem sleepy or a little cranky tonight, it's the effects of the meds. But next week, I'll feel a whole lot better and I'll be able to move on. And as far as what um, is going on in the Pittsburgh area right now, it's kind of like normal. You know, you go to the doctor that they... The, 
that you need to see as far as it for me anyway I, you know there are some plans that are offered that aren't as good as luckily the plan that I have and you're limited in your access still but that's um, because of the plan limitations um, but go ahead I'm sorry I was there's an audience question uh, asking if you feel that Jeffrey Romoff's retirement from UPMC, I guess that was last year, helped improve the situation. Um, and have you seen other communities uh, take this kind of action? I know there are other places where there are sort of the two big behemoths fighting at each other like two dinosaurs. But to me, um, well, we are very hopeful that the the exit of Mr. Romoff is going to um, make a difference and that things will, it, it's a 10 year contract. We're what, three years into it. We don't know what the limitations of the contract are. Um, and as far as contracts go, both parties can walk away by agreement at any time. They can, if they agree, they can break the contract. So. There is a lot of concern about that, but we are very hopeful that that Mr. Romas exit. And um, I, I, sorry, I forget the name of the new uh, person who took his place. We hope that she's a little more reasonable when it comes to renegotiating or whatever. So here's a question for Sandra. Um, in your interactions with all of these politicians, including Mr. Grassley, what were the sentiments around the idea of getting away from a for-profit health care system? The, the sentiments of getting away from it? Um, I, well, I mean, certainly with um, Senator Grassley, there was a lot of frustration about nonprofit hospitals and um, you know this the, the bad behavior, honestly, and, and his frustration with the IRS not holding them accountable. Um, and, you know, of course, the IRS would come back and say, well, we don't have the funding to hold them accountable and we don't know what benefits each community in each neighborhood. And um, so I think there's a there's a lot more that can be done, as, as Libby said in the film, um, to hold them accountable. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't I think that there's just frustration on on from the politician side. Um, that there really isn't a lot of accountability, accountability, uh, you know, when it comes to nonprofit hospitals and and how they're they're really, you know, getting away with a lot and um, there's not really much being done. Actually, Libby, this is here's a good question for you. Um, you said you keep turning it against hospitals, but the problem is vertical integration, as one of the movie's characters described. The insurance companies own the hospitals, the doctors, and the income stream from patients. Although I would I would add that sometimes the hospitals, in this case, own everything. But private practice physician. Uh, practices operate at a lower cost with better outcomes than system-owned groups. How do you propose to strengthen private practice, or can we at this point? Well, I, I, you know, I think we want to say the problem is horizontal integration or vertical integration, and it's all of the above. It's the the um, the evolution of our system to. I think you you use the word dinosaurs, but it's kind of the land of the giants, and so poor patients and poor individual doctors who are just trying to um, do the right thing uh, for each other. So I, I do think we need to strengthen, um, you know, physician autonomy. And one of, one of the things I hoped would come out of writing my book was like to get physicians angry so they banded together. Because <laughs> I kept saying like, you guys, you know, if you don't bring your patients to the hospital, they don't got no business. So you have power. But, you know, they're, I think, on the whole, the hospitals hold all sorts of threats over physicians' heads, often like loss of, of you know, contracts, loss of operating room privilege, privileges. And it's, um, you know, physicians have been bullied, and I don't think, the AMA, for example, and state medical societies have done a very good job for standing up for, for individual physicians. You know, I would like to see stronger doctors unions. I'd like to see more militancy among 
physicians, you know, one, but you see the physicians who become most militant are the ones who are close to retirement. There was one surgeon I spoke to who, who became a Medicare for all advocate, actually, and he refused to do surgery at his hospital. He went to a different hospital for some of his procedures because he felt they were overcharging. You know, they did the thing like you're lying in the oh, in the uh, recovery room and you're being charged in 15 minute intervals because a business consultant said, why do you let them lie there for free? You know, when usually the reason you're lying in the recovery room for all that time is because the surgeons are at dinner or they're holding, you know, it's it's ridiculous. And he said, well, what's the worst they can do? Take away my parking space? But, you know, he was about to retire. So he was, you know, younger physicians. I don't think they want to sell their practices to hospitals necessarily. But, um, you know, they have a very hard time doing battle with those other giants, the big insurers or, you know, the device makers. So we, we've almost created a system that is the land of the giants and the poor individuals who, who are just trying to do the right thing and the patients are really suffering. So here's a I question would, I, that... Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I, would, I was just going to add um, to what Libby said. Um, you know, we, we did interview Dr. Dale Owen in the film and, and he, he's in there, but we weren't we didn't have time in the film to kind of go into what his physician's practice was able to accomplish. Um, their physician's practice was try on medical group and they were actually the first ph uh, physician's group that left. They sued, well, you know, actually Atrium Healthcare sued them because they broke their non-competes and left. And, um, and you know, we're trying to start their own group and they, they were able to, to win and they succeeded because the community was with them. They were the doctors. So here's, here's the question. Oh, go ahead, Beth. I'm sorry. Um, you know, in the film, at the end, when they when they've announced that there's an agreement, and they ask what my thoughts are, and I say that my second phone call was from my doctor's office. It was actually from my doctor's office, from the nurse congratulating me, say, and they actually said thank you, thank you for the work you did, because now we can treat our patients and we don't have to worry. So that's how the doctor they they couldn't say anything because they couldn't go against their employer but they were really, really rooting for us. So here's a question I very much want to ask all three of you, because I'm sure you will have different answers to it. And the question is, to hold hospital systems accountable, what would good community benefit policies look like to you? Obviously, suing patients and, and having, uh, having employees with medical debt is not it. Um, so Libby, why don't you start? What, what should we be seeing from nonprofit hospitals in terms of actual community benefit? Uh, well, part of me believes that um, there we we can never you know we can never rely on trust to do this. I mean, at the now there's really nothing. No, you know you should do some community benefit and uh, charity care, but how much? What you know? What should count? There really aren't any guardrails. So I think we could start by having a more defined notion of what community benefit means. And of course, it means treating uninsured people, right? That's that which which hospitals, you know, do only if it's something that comes into the emergency room under EMTALA. So, you know, that's a very well-defined thing. Um, I, I, you know, part of me feels like, uh, you know, that maybe we should just ask them to pay taxes because you look at what they're building and what they're paying their executives. And if they're not act, um, acting like nonprofits, maybe they should have their not-for-profit status pulled. And, it, you know, a few very brave politicians, mayors, have tried to do that. And it is, including in Pittsburgh, it's a totally David versus Goliath thing because, you know, city governments are not lawyered up the way UPMC or any big hospital system in the in the US is now. So I, I think that's a solution that's gone completely unexplored because it's politically um, very difficult to pull off. Um, Sandra, what would you what would you think? What would what would look like community benefit from nonprofit hospitals to you? Yeah, I think to me, I mean, in, in researching 
for this film and, and you know, filming the, the documentary, what I learned is every community is very different and the needs are very different. And, you know, there was at a certain point in time, um, you know, when they were coming up with the ACA, there was this idea to make make it so that a com- the community themselves could come up with a plan of what would benefit the community. And I can't remember, I'm sure Libby remembers the, the name of that those organizations that were supposed to, it was supposed to be a bunch of different community actors, a bunch of people from different places coming together and, and really kind of debating and deciding what is best and presenting that plan to the hospitals. And, but there, there's, there's just, there's nothing in place, no regulations in place to, to make the hospital do those things that the community is telling them to do. So there's a disconnect there. Um, in, in Pittsburgh, actually, the new uh, mayor, who um, Ed Ganey, who actually was in our film, he was a state representative when we filmed um, with him. And uh, he's the mayor now, and he is uh, working very diligently to try to get uh, what they call a pilot program, which is a payment in lieu of taxes. Um, again, not really trusting that UPMC is going to be giving the community what they need and just saying, okay, just give us the money <laughs> and we can decide how to how to um, help the community. So there are plans. I, the, the former mayor of Pittsburgh was also trying to do a similar plan. He wasn't able to pull it off. You know, we're, we're, we're rooting for, for Mayor Ganey to be able to do that. Beth, what would you like to see from from hospital from nonprofit hospitals who are supposed to be providing benefit to the community? Well, um, I'll take say Jude Hospital as an example. Um, every day in my in my email inbox, I get solicitations from the Children's Hospital Foundation asking for money so that they can treat kids under whatever kids without insurance, whatever. St. Jude never charges anybody anything. So if you're making all these profits as a nonprofit and you're not paying taxes as a nonprofit, quit asking me for more money because I've already given you my tax dollars and just give these children at Children's Hospital, which you took over, which was a community children's hospital, and now you're a UPMC children's hospital with this giant footprint in the city, Start just giving those children free care without having to ask me for more money on top of my tax dollars. That, I think, would be a wonderful thing. Or the Ronald McDonald houses that ask me for more money all the time so that people who have someone with a life-threatening illness or whatever can stay near their loved one. Quit asking me for more money for that because... UPMC, Allegheny Health Network, whomever, set up another, uh, 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 an AHN house or a UPMC house where those people can stay for free and quit asking me for more money on top of my tax dollars. So, you know, I think that would be a good start. Pay for roads being cleared. Pay for the sidewalks being cleared. All those things would be wonderful instead of taking more of my tax dollars do that on top of your nonprofit status. And it's true, they're taking the, the tax dollars. The, the taxes they don't pay are preventing things like clearing the roads. Libby, did you want to add something? I, w- I wanted to say something because these tax breaks are so valuable to these hospitals. The city of San Francisco at some at one point went, uh, went after, um, I believe it was the uh, the Sutter system in, in there, which you mentioned in the film. And boy, you know, they, Sutter was like, we'll build a subway, we'll build housing, we'll do anything but give up our tax break. So maybe we should look at the hospital surpluses and say, you know, go back to, the, the, Julie, you remember these, these old days where there were certificate of need. If you... How about instead of building that new wing for, you know, $10 million, you give that back to this. If there's a surplus, let's call it what it is. It's a profit and you're not for profit and give it to, give it back to the city in, in, you know, don't call it a tax, but call it your obligation as a not for profit. 
yeah, we used to have something called health planning where yeah. uh, hospitals had to actually go to lawmakers, to policymakers and say, we would like to build another wing. We would like to open a new maternity ward. We would like to have a burn unit. We would like to have to do orthopedic surgery, which is probably a lot more lucrative. And basically the, there would be some public body that would tell them whether or not uh, the, the community needed it. So now we just have hospitals, Libby, as you point out, adding and adding and adding. Um, so there's an overcapacity in a lot of places, which is not really helping anyone. So, so here's a, a political question, but Sandra, I really want to ask you, um, does what policies should we demand our politicians support to rein in hospitals and uh, improve the system? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not mm -hmm. a, I'm not a healthcare policy uh, person. So I think the best answer that I've, that I have for that is that um, there are several groups who are, are working with policymakers on you know, just writing up certain, you know, um, laws that could possibly hold them accountable, but nothing is, is really has been crystallized yet. Um, there has been the transparency bill, which we all know hospitals are not complying, many hospitals are not complying with, um, you know, there's the surprise billing legislation and all these kind of chip away. Um, but really, and, and what was said in the film, you know, by several of the healthcare economists we, uh, films with was, price regulation, you know, and that's, that's a hard pill. That's a hard pill to swallow. Right. Um, you know, antitrust regulation would be great. Um, but there's, there's, you know, as, as the film states, 90% of the markets are heavily consolidated already. So, um, you know, there are certain areas in the country that aren't South Florida, where I live is one of them. Um, Southern California is another. So looking at those areas and, and really being vigilant, on um, the mergers and acquisitions that are trying to occur there. Libby, your, your years yeah. in Washington now, you've seen how hard it is to get anything done, even some of these sort of smaller <laughs> things like the transparency uh, rules and the surprise billing rules. I mean, is there is there something small that would be a start that we could ask for more politicians? There's certainly a lot of disappointment in moving to DC where you understand how <laughs> hard it is to make this sausage. But, you know, um, just as a little like token um, in campaigns and in, in, uh, the, the, the uh, last election, the last presidential election, everyone was saying, I'm not going to take money from pharma. How about saying I'm not going to take money from hospitals? I mean, hospitals and hospital associations are some of the biggest donors to uh, senators and congressmen, and you see it, you know, they're the big constituent, they're the biggest employer, they're the biggest donor. Why don't they say that? You know, that might at least start making a difference. Um, I think on the consolidation issue, one of the important things that really needs to be addressed, and I'm not kind of fluent enough in regulation to know how this happens, is um, many of these these ex, uh, expansionist networks grow by accretion, and according to the FTC's charter and the Justice Department, unless they reach a value of $100 million, they're not uh, under regulatory purview. So if you buy, you know, a few surge centers here and a little, you know, it's kind of all happening and happened under the radar. And so I think that really needs to be changed too. Yeah, it's what Farzad calls in the film, Pac-Man consolidation, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sandra, here's a question for you. Um, she said, uh, uh, it said, I see that the Mayo Clinic declined interviews. What did you want to ask them? And I would also say, what, what would you have asked the American Hospital Association if they'd agreed to, to sit down for an interview? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would have loved to have spoken to them. You know, I think for me, uh, coming in as a filmmaker, um, you know, somebody who has done films on all types of different things. I'm not a healthcare expert. I'm not a policy person. So, um, you know, I was I was really I am genuinely interested in 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 you know the their perspective. And I think for, for me, I mean, even when I was sitting down with the, the Charles River associate folks who did the research for American Hospital Association, you know, for me, it, you know, they're, 
their argument is that consolidation is very beneficial. You know, it leads to efficiency and coordination and, um, you know, shared medical records amongst all of these different providers and, um, and that costs go down because of economies of scale and all these things. And, and I, that all sounds great to me, <laughs> you know, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And can I give well, the counterpoint that that was true in the 80s when things were really disaggregated and every little town had its own little hospital that, you know, did its own laundry and had its own medical records. Now it's gone so far past the we're gaining efficiency for medical care. We're gaining efficiency in bargaining for better prices and charging more. But I think, um, you know, and the medical records thing is like, oof, you know, try getting your medical records shipped from, you know, the whole point of digitizing medical records was, was that they could be sent anywhere. And they often can't even be sent between two hospitals in the same system very well. So um, I, I think there's a lot of a kind of nice sounding justification for the degree of, of uh, consolidation we see now, but it really doesn't bear, it, it doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Yeah. Sandra, so, it, okay. I'm sorry, Sandra, you can correct me if I, uh, or add on. When the film was premiering at, at, in New York at the, uh, New York Doc, uh, Doc Festival. Um, prior to when it was announced that it was going to be there, the AHA issued talking points and action points to all of their hospital, uh, the, the people they represent. And Sandra can correct me if I'm wrong. They accidentally sent it to the inhospitable website, right, Sandra? And we learned I, I think they, that they actually the, they actually just made it public. Public. They, they, it was but, on the AHA website. Okay. Yeah. The first talking point was stop suing your poor patients for for unpaid men. Um, second one was get your records in order. You might be being scrutinized. So I think if Sandra were able to ask those people, that, you know, to interview them, had they agreed to an interview. Perhaps she may have asked, why did you say these things? You know, like, why, why do you have to tell the hospitals to stop suing their poor patients? <laughs> right, um, right. And I, I think that, that that's the thing for me. You know, of course, Jeffrey Romoff was kind of played the perfect villain, as, you know, the controller Wagner said. Um, and, um, you know, but I think for, for me, I, I wasn't looking at the people running these hospitals as, these villainous people trying to suck money to me. It just, it just seemed, you know, like what Dr. Pearl said in the film, it was just, it's this incompatible world where you have the people at the top running these businesses and their MBAs. And, you know, Libby talks about this in her book too. And they're just looking at their bottom line and they're running the businesses. And there's a real disconnect between what they're doing in, in the, that top floor of UPMC. Right. And what's going on on the ground? And so I, I was really interested in in just discussing that as well that that disconnect and how to kind of bring things back. I mean, you know, this difference between looking at a, a patient as a consumer um, and a source of income, right? Um, I think you know when Libby said our bodies and our pain are the ATM, it was it's kind of the perfect metaphor. I have to say, I was actually in Pittsburgh in 2015 with a group of reporters, and we met with Jeffrey Romoff on the top floor of what used to be the U.S. Steel Building. It is now the UPMC Building. And it was such a metaphor to really look out over the city. It's an incredible view. Uh, but, you know, it, it sort of he was like, this is ours, and we can do basically whatever we want with it. I mean, that was the a, man in the effectively. High yeah, yeah, how and it was. Well, what does it say likewise that, okay, in Pittsburgh, the former U.S. Steel Tower is now UPMC. In Chicago, the former IBM Tower is the American Medical Association Plaza. You know, mm -hmm. who, 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 you know what are the big businesses today? Um, yeah. And it shouldn't be. So, yeah. Beth, here's a question for you. Um, you obviously, you know, were, were one of many people who went up against these two enormous presences and managed to prevail. So someone wants to know, what was the most effective effort that you used to affect change? 
um, just making our voices heard, contacting uh, um, just contacting our representatives, going to Harrisburg and confronting them in person, um, just n never giving up and always pushing forward. Um, There was a really good chance we were going to fail, but those of us who, Vicki, uh, Evie, me, and there were other people, but we were, the, you know, we were always there together. We just refused to give up. We refused to accept it because our lives were at stake, um, and that's a really, really strong catalyst to uh, <laughs> to action is when when they tell you you know you only have this length of time to live and we're doing our best but sorry we can't do that best anymore because you're not allowed to see us that that's unacceptable you, it, you can lie down in a corner and accept it or you can continue to fight and that's what we did so we're about to yeah. wrap up oh I would say I want I was, my, my yeah, last no, question for all yeah. of you is what do you want the audience to take away from this film? So Sandra, you start. I just wanted to add one more thing to what Beth said, which is what I learned um, about when I was making this film is the importance of the connection that you have with your state representatives. You know, I think that they're they're overlooked a lot of times. I think a lot of people don't even know the names of their state representatives. And I think, you know, especially when it comes to hospitals, it, there's a lot that can be done at the state level, you know, and, and that's something that you were able to see in this in this film. Um, so I think uh, so as far as, you know, um, well, one thing I, I also wanted to mention is uh, community screenings uh, are really important for this particular fil for films like this grassroots films like this. And so if, if people are interested in doing a community screening, if, if you love this film, you want to show it to your organization group school, whatever, please reach out to us through the website and let us know. Um, we would love to be able to do that. Um, and we have a discussion guide that we can provide as well. Um, you know, for me, I think, you know, I would love, I would love for there to be a lot more scrutiny on, in particular, nonprofit hospitals. You know, I think we've seen the effect um, that they can have on communities at so many different levels, at the patient level, at the worker level, community level. So um, I think that would be that would be fantastic. And we are currently trying to get it screened with the uh, Association of Attorneys Generals um, and just as many people as can watch it. Um, we did screen the film with the uh, antitrust subcommittee uh, at the House and the Senate. Um, so we're just continuing to, to push and, and get the film out there. Libby, what would you like people? Attention. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. They're paying attention because I got a call from Senator Klobuchar's office after they screened it and asked for me to come and testify before a Senate subcommittee. I got asked to testify before an FTC committee. Um, when we went to Harrisburg, we met with the head of the uh, insurance committee and we asked her if there was anything she could do. She said she's not hearing from her constituents, so she doesn't think it's that important. So, you know, they are listening, but you have to tell them. You have, you have to let them know what, what's going on. You have to talk to them. So. Libby, last word. What, what would you like people what? to take away from this? Um, that, uh, you know, I think it's very impressive that you guys won in the end. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that I think there's a kind of learned helplessness when it comes to our healthcare system. And that, you know, UPMC is doing what hospitals in every state are doing. They're just a little better at doing it and a little more brazen about how they do it. So, you know, if you're look at your local hospital, don't look at, you know, the head of UPMC as a particular villain or you, it's an iconic story of what's going on in cities all across America. And I hope people will see it and take inspiration and say, you know, we're not going to take this anymore. We don't have to put up with it. Thank you. Well, 
thank you to our panel. Thank you, Sandra, for making the film. Um, and we were going to thank you. turn it back over to you. Can I, can I say one last thing? I hope also politicians will take a little bit of inspiration from Josh Shapiro, who who bucked the the trend and um, took on who, what was power, probably a powerful political uh, enemy to make, but he did. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the reason I actually made this film, Libby, is because when I call after I read the book, I called you. And I, I was talking to you and you said, you know, there's a attorney general in Pennsylvania who just filed a lawsuit. You might want to check out that story. So, so. And yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize it was the same person until who's running for, you know, who, who yeah. I see on TV now. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. Running, running for governor. Um, yeah. Well, so Sandra, you're going to have to make a sequel at some point. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.